Hey folks, Corey Nelson here. This is the UX Plus One Podcast, and this is episode number five. Today, we are talking about day in the life vlogs. Have you seen those? Have you seen those YouTube videos where folks talk about this is a day in the life of a UX designer or the day of life in the, of a software engineer, and you follow them around as they wake up and they go to work and do their job? Have you seen those? They're freaking stupid. I can't wait to talk about them. Let's get into this episode. this is your first time joining us, welcome. On this show, we discuss various topics under the umbrella of user experience and product design. And we have a very special format to this show, and that is who we've invited as our plus one. A plus one is our guest. These are the folks who are having some difficulty in their UX career search. We take a look at their materials, like their resume, their portfolio, and we give them some expert advice and help to get them past their difficulties, get them past their challenges, and hopefully see them higher. And a very quick thing to point out, if you are listening to the audio stream of this podcast, please note that we do have the video version that is on YouTube. You can find that at uxdesignjob.com forward slash podcast. We have the video version in case anyone wants to follow along with the guidance that we are giving our guests as we go through their resume and portfolio. So just want to make sure everybody knows that. If you're interested in appearing on our show, we'll have some information on how to do that at the end. Until then, let's get into today's show. My friend, Antonio, what are we talking about today? Today, we will be discussing day in the life vlogs of being UX designers and researchers. Day Should be life. an interesting one. Oh my God, no, not this. <laughs> this is, okay. This was, um, if I recall, one of the one of the catalysts for actually starting this podcast was this topic. <laughs> is that right? I think it was. This was one of the first things that came to mind. Of this is the this is the kind of thing that we have to debunk. <laughs> I know this topic is very near and dear to your heart, Corey. Yeah this this makes me. <laughs> This makes me not want to live on this planet anymore <laughs> when I see these videos. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I can't say I've sat through the entirety of any of them. I've tried, I've probably tried to watch two or three, and I just couldn't get through them. There's, there's so much crap, <laughs> it's, it's so much stupidity, and so much. I, I just couldn't deal with it. I couldn't deal with, um, you know, who wakes up and has this, uh, this very elaborate. Uh, breakfast and exercise and skin routine and you know who has time to do that every day right and uh, I watched one this morning to try and become to re-familiarize myself with it because I haven't watched one in a while and did, uh, did you get through it, it? no definitely not <laughs> <laughs> after she warmed up her oatmeal I'm like I'm done I'm done <laughs> you know what Corey maybe they have minions that way they can wake up exercise uh, and yeah, do whatever yeah and just do it for who knows them. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah they're they are difficult to sit through and it, it's so much it's so much fluff right and even especially to the point where they when they supposedly get to their jobs right and oh my gosh work is so much fun we we sit in and and draw and play on whiteboards all day and uh, our, our offices are filled <laughs> with, with sticky notes and uh, everyone loves each other. We have these really energetic and, and happy conversations about the project we're working on. Yeah, and glorifying the, meetings that oh yeah, I gone yeah. You you be <laughs> when you start working right, you be so over meetings right. You're so done with that after your first week. It was like oh my, I can't believe I got another call. I got another meeting. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Once you've been beaten down a little bit by life and in your career, you, you don't take those videos at their word anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then and then wrapping it up with, 
Yeah, let's all go out for for drinks and and uh, fancy food, and everyone loves each other still. And we'll do this all again tomorrow. And when reality is like, I can't wait to get out of here. I'm tired of seeing you folks. Um, <laughs> I saw enough. Of, you know, I saw I'm glad I don't feel alone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, right? Yeah, yeah. I saw enough of you today. I'm gonna go see some other real people. In my life. That's exactly it. Yeah. And then I'm gonna go, and then I guess I'll come back and hang out with y'all tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, they pay me to do this yes yes <laughs> i would not see any of y'all if they weren't paying me enough oh man i mean you know what we should do we should do a vlog <laughs> of what a real like, ux designer or ux researcher goes through that would be so boring though right that no so <laughs> then it, it would be dramatic and we can add effects like i barely have time to eat during my day maybe some tears that drop down yeah, you know we need to go. make the yeah. opposite of it yeah yeah we'll 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 liven it up for the for the camera yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, do, we'll put the hollywood splash on it i'll show you my healthy breakfast of three cups of coffee before right. 9 30 in the morning <laughs> right right <laughs> right we'll, we'll 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 put some some nice violin music over when i see how how many freaking meetings i have for the day yeah. <laughs> uh, you know i was i was thinking about oh you know putting my own spin on, well not my own spin but just kind of a real take of what i would do of, of what i typically do during a day right what's a what's a typical day for Corey nelson as a senior designer at his at one of his jobs and i'm still working out what a typical day is for my current job because i haven't been there that long but i was thinking about you know, considering what I did in my last job, uh, you know, when I started, I was on a, a program for, uh, it was for, it was government work. And then I moved over to another job. It was, I mean, another, another program within that, within that job. And I was doing work for the U.S. tax court, which I tell folks is probably one of the driest subjects you could ever, you know, ever, <laughs> ever have, you know, be the, unfortunately be put on. It was, a, it was a great team. Just the subject was pretty dry. A day in that life, a day in that project was uh, I'd have a stand up first thing in the morning and we would talk about our team's goals and, and my goals for that day. The length of that stand up, I mean, stand ups vary, you know, team to team, project to project. From that one, that, pro that stand up was an hour, which was really long for a stand up. Uh, Stand-ups usually don't go more than 15 minutes, but that one was an hour. After that, I would present uh, any usability research that we may have had. Uh, sometimes we didn't have any news, so we didn't, I didn't necessarily do that all the time. Uh, sometimes we would have to extend that call, you know, past the full hour to make sure that the, the stakeholders really understood what we were trying to portray and we were trying to, that we were trying to help them understand right, the nuances of the development process. Uh, I introduced some teammates to the absolute genius of chill hop music and lo-fi music, which is absolutely required. If you get into UX design, please, please put that on your resume. It's, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, and then meeting with the project manager and the engineering lead about ideas to outline, what was it? It was a, a delivery health assessment model, right? So something new we were picking up. And then pairing with another designer on how to start our next phase or planning our next phase of research. And then maybe towards the end of the day, I had a mock-up to put together for a visual fix that he, uh, for a technical bug that came up. So <clears throat> thinking about design, right? And here I am, senior designer, how much design went into that day, right? We have eight hours in, in a typical day. That's 480 minutes. How much time did I spend making something, right? When it came to fixing it, making that mock-up. That was about 10 minutes. Right? That's about all it took to do that. And that was a very typical day for me. So out of the entire time I spent at my desk and uh, doing work for that job, for that company, I spent about 10 minutes that day making something right, in the design tool, making a, an artifact to share with the rest of the team. So a day in the life vlog would be very, very uneventful, right? If someone had the misfortune of having to follow me around with a camera, right? Or if I was crazy enough to have a camera pointing at myself the whole day. That's the big thing about these videos, I think, is they misconstrue or they, they don't really portray 
the day in the life of a designer very accurately. Yeah. And I think depending on where you are in the career ladder, you're going to be doing different things as a designer. Cause I, I feel like a lot of times design managers or senior designers don't necessarily have the time to push pixels around. Like if that mm-hmm. needs to happen, they're probably going to push that down mm-hmm. to a junior or a mid-level designer that they trust can get the work done mm-hmm. quickly because they have other things they have to focus on. They're usually managing stakeholders and, um, you know, setting up meetings and, and taking part in more high level things. At least that's how it works where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the big part of my day is like you said, stakeholder management It's relationship management. It's project management. It's making sure the project is moving along. Design was a very, very small part of my day. And I agree that there's a lot of, uh, it's not just these kind of blogs, but they definitely contribute to the misinterpretation of what it really means to be in UX today. And people get into the discipline for all the wrong reasons. Go ahead, Crystal, you're about to say something. (laughs) Well, I was going to ask Corey, I'm curious, because you said it's about five to 10 minutes. Do you miss designing? It depends. So when I say I miss, if I were to say I miss designing, I would be, I would be hearkening back to many, many years ago, like when I I initially got into design. Um, I was thinking about this recently because when I got into design, it was like early 2000s. Flash was a very big thing, uh, Macromedia Flash and Adobe mm-hmm. Flash. And, you know, that stuff's not even around anymore. But that's what drew me into design. And for me, that's when design was fun. That's when that's what actually sparked my career because there were no rules back then. We can just do what we want and we did whatever we thought was cool. And designing web applications and websites today, that stuff's not cool. It all looks the same, right? And it's it's, <laughs> it's like that for a reason, right? And yeah. it, it has to yeah. be that way. And it's, that's fine. But, you know, that's not what sparks my interest anymore. So, uh, yeah, I would say I miss design, but not in the sense that I wish I would do more of today's work more. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, it's all pattern based now. You know, yep. there's through all of that work, you know, when you were getting into design, I feel like that's when all the patterns that we follow now, all of the guidelines and rules that we follow now, I feel like that's when they were being built, when they were being discovered. Yeah. But now it's like, you know, you plug something into Figma auto layout. You don't even have to, to look for uh, like, like measure pixels on the screen anymore or make mm-hmm. sure that everything is, is spaced correctly because you have auto layout to do that. It's, it's, I've heard so much talk about, you know, AI work and that kind of stuff. I feel like it's going to get to the point where designers are basically, you know, synthesizing research and putting inputs into a AI, and then mm-hmm. you're going to get a user interface out of it. That's right. Yeah. I remember when I, when I was coming up and I was learning web design as it was, and one of the things that was always a huge challenge that we had to take into account for was making sure your design function more or less the same across different browsers and that was really what made me get out of doing coding of to get out of doing front end coding because i hated that i hated having to do that every every you know you you put something together in photoshop or whatever and it looks great and you translate it to chrome and it looks fine and you put it in firefox and it looks terrible right or you put it in microsoft it was internet ie IE, or internet explorer it looked terrible and you had to kind of find these fixes between all three. And I hated it. I absolutely hated that. Today, I don't think that's a problem anymore. I think more or less, more or less all of that has been kind of fixed with, um, you know, JavaScript frameworks and uh, CSS frameworks. And they're all, they've all kind of solved that. Yeah. But it's just one of those things that, you know, back in the day, it was one of those things we struggled with, along with other rules. And sometimes we just broke the rules and didn't care. <laughs> right? Yep. The golden days. Yeah. Yeah. Crystal, what's your experience like as a researcher? I feel like you've got a probably a different perspective on, on what yeah. your day is like. Crystal's day is probably going to make us look terrible. She's yeah, like, right. No. Like, we're a bunch of bums. <laughs> These bunch to be of honest, bums. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> I, I, it's funny because I was going to ask Antonio what his day looked like, but I'll go ahead. Um, well, my day, okay, my day is a bit all over the place but it's it's always has pretty much the same structure I like to know um the night before what my game plan is that's just me as a person 
I'm saying that because sometimes I have projects that are overlapping uh, during a day and I want to make sure that I'm mentally ready to like tackle different products. So when I wake up, obviously I log in and then I check um, what my game plan is. Usually I have um, back to back remote sessions uh, with participants and usability testing. And that could be local in, or inter, international. So it's either English, um, French. Sometimes I have people that speak different languages. So I try to help them out um, if I understand those languages. So it can be one project. It can be two. It can be three. I had one day where I was um, moderating four different projects in a day. So that's just one section of my day. Um, other than that, while I'm doing that, um, I need to make sure that I can support and assist uh, junior researchers in their projects. Um, if, I, if I have another project going on, I'm usually designing the script and the questions and running that through while managing and, and talking to other uh, stakeholders for other projects. Um, I know it seems uh, a bit vague, but pretty much what I do every day is I conduct uh, usability sessions, whether it's one, two, th three projects, um, and that can take up to six, seven hours of my day. But when I do that, um, I'm live on the camera. So it's not like I can get up, take a break. I'm literally sitting. So when I finish a session, uh, I'm very active. So I like to get up, stretch, dance, put a song just so I can get out of my head because it can be very exhausting to conduct research and to keep um, focused and asking the right questions when you're talking to someone. And we run with a lot of tech issues. So that can be uh, draining as well because you're problem solving on the spot. It's a live session. And so that's what I do during my day. And while I'm doing that, I'm managing other projects uh, and meetings. I don't have a lot of meetings. I'm really lucky because my manager is like, we don't have time for meetings. Whoever wants to meet us can figure that out. Our meetings are usually a kickoff. So if someone wants to come in, they have a project, we want to know their research goals, their objectives, um, timelines, and all of that, and introduce ourselves, takes an hour, maybe once a week. We have a team meeting that's 30 minutes. We're very, very proactive. We're very fast, too. Like, our, our team is always super busy, so we don't have time to sit in a two-hour meeting, listen, and be like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Us, it's like, go run, finish mm -hmm. the project, analyze, give the report, and sometimes I don't have time to eat. I try to make time, but like I said, I'm live on the camera. So that's pretty much how my day looks like. I feel like if I would film it on YouTube, people will be like, um, I'm not sure I want to do that. <laughs> Career change. Career <laughs> change. Yeah. But I have fun with it because I love to talk to people. So it's really on your, you know, how you twist things around and your perspective. I have fun with it. It's it's pretty fun. It just, it can get very exhausting uh, brain-wise. So when I'm done my day, I don't talk to anybody. I don't even talk to anybody. Like I just need to sit, stare at the white wall or go in the forest. My mm. brain is just going to explode. I have a lot of people complaining. You don't even call me. You don't even do this. I don't, I can't talk. All I do is talk. So please leave me alone. <laughs> But You're yeah. right, Corey. Her her day makes us look like bums. Yeah, I, I, I kind of figured that was gonna happen. Yeah. No, no, trust me. Some days I have, I have some days I don't. I'm not that busy, uh, but these are just a tip, like typical day. Mm -hmm. And so interesting, you know, that she's, you know, Crystal. You're you're, <coughs> you're multilingual, right? Which is amazing for someone coming from South Texas as we've identified from your accent. But, not from yeah. South Texas. <laughs> come, come on. Crystal, you're among friends here. You need to just come clean. We all recognize oh. a Texas accent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Strong Houston vibes over here, Crystal. Yeah. What? Yeah. Should I move there at this point? Like, what's going on? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's so it's interesting that your day is, is you know, your, your day is, is literally back to back work. Right. And it's just, there's no time for doing, you know, unimportant stuff like on a whiteboard or. No, no, we don't time. have time. Yeah. <laughs> there's no time, yeah. no time for hiccups at there all. You go. Yeah. And it's so good because <clears throat> in almost every job that I've worked in, there's always someone, there's always at least one person whose job is to keep you on calls with them, right? <laughs> that is that is so annoying to find that person. I'm not gonna say the job title, but 
because <laughs> people at work are going to be like, what are you talking about me? But <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's so easy. They'll it's, be happy <laughs> that you talk about them on this video. So tell them yes. <laughs> Not in this respect, yeah. Because <laughs> I can't stand being on calls all day with, you know, for stuff that's just, that could have been an email, right? There's all, you've seen that, those, exactly. those memes yeah. or whatever. It's like, this this meeting could have been an email. And that is so true for almost 90% of the time. Right? Like, we did not have to schedule this call. We do not have to have these calls every single day. We do not have to have these very long calls a couple of times a week. We could just asynchronously put together what we're doing, store it on an email or on a, a Confluence page somewhere, and everyone can see and has that visibility. Like, we just don't have to do these calls. But exactly. Some people feel that being on calls and getting FaceTime with people is important and it uh, it helps with camaraderie and all this other stuff. But we it just brings you out quicker. It does. It does. It takes it. It induces a lot of context switching, which is really terrible for you getting your work done because your brain takes several minutes, sometimes up to an hour to do that effectively. And if you're doing that several times a day, you're losing a lot of time. Yeah. And don't be afraid to say no. Like I always flag those. Oh, let's talk. Let's chat. No, mm. you can send me an email. I really don't have time. Mm. That's the culture in our team. Like we mm. don't have time to chit chat. So I'm just good. Saying, yeah, yeah, that is good. If Put your limitations, team. you know, and, yeah. and just use your common sense. Mm -hmm. That's so great because your whole team being like that is, <clears> is, <throat> is fantastic. I have a feeling if I started doing that, my boss would start coming down on me and like, hey, you're not you're not being visible and people aren't seeing you and don't know what you're doing, what you're up to. I'm like, people know what I'm up to, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty open about that. Just, you should join my team. <laughs> yeah, <I> maybe. Mean, <laughs> it's also, you know, we're all adults here, so yeah, have a level of trust. I feel like a lot of that is just an organization's inability to trust its its employees. Yeah, they, they want you to be visible at all times. What are you doing? You know, are you green on Slack? All of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm in a similar boat as Crystal where we don't we don't have any standups. Um, we have very limited meetings and there is a understanding that once you hit that half an hour, once you hit that hour, it's like meeting is over. If we have more to talk about, then let's schedule something else for later on in the week. Hmm. We do, we have what's called our UX diary. So for my team, we have in Confluence, we have just like a table with every day on it throughout the month. And we break them those months up into each quarter and that's our standup. So I'll put down all the things that I'm doing, maybe my blockers, maybe notes that I have, things that I've done. I'll talk about those in these bi-weekly meetings that we have uh, one on a Tuesday and one on a Friday. They're called the sunrise and sunset meetings where we kind of all get together with our PM and our DevOps lead. And we kind of go through the things that we're going to be doing that week. And then at the end of the week meeting, we go through the things that we did that week. Um, it's a great time to ask questions. It's a great time to get feedback on things, maybe share some del deliverables if you have any of that stuff. Most of my work, I wake up in the morning and we have a scrum board on Jira and I basically pick which story I want to work on that day or that week, and I get to work on it. That might be research. It might be talking to users. It might be working out a wireframe. It might be polishing the design system. I mean, it can be anything. Every day is, is really different. Right now, it's kind of heavily into sort of handoff work, QA work, identifying like business rules, that kind of thing, user flows because we're about to release a new feature. So we're kind of in heavy support mode, supporting our designs for that. It's pretty nice because it allows everyone to be autonomous, but it also allows for that visibility because we're constantly updating our Jira boards. We're constantly updating our Confluence pages, but it's not like we're shackled down or tied down by having to be in endless meetings that become pointless after a while. It's mm -hmm. like, here's what we want to talk about. Let's end it and let's move on to the next thing. That's a, that's a much different experience from anything that I've had before at other organizations. Mm -hmm. I like it because it allows for more flexibility and freedom. And, and you're always doing something. You're always busy working on stuff. And when we groom our sprint, the other cool thing that I like is we we build in time, like personal time for professional development. So we have a company-wide Udemy um, profile mm -hmm. account, basically. So I, I might have two stories where it's like, I want to improve my sketching skills or I want to improve my user research skills. And I'll take these classes 
throughout the month uh, to improve the skills. And it's actually part of my work that has been kind of allotted for me mm. throughout that sprint. So it's like, we try to balance ourselves. If I get too burnt out on doing stuff for the product, let me just jump in here and work on, you know, improving these skills for half an hour this morning. That's pretty excellent. That's pretty, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't think I've ever worked somewhere where they've, they've had that kind of thing built in. I mean, I've, I've had allotments where they, you know, they give you, you know, a budget or something to, to do that, but it's, it's never part of your weekly, you know, you know, time of work. I've never seen that. That's an excellent idea. It is. And, and the other thing, sorry, real quick is, is I'll just say that we're, they don't call us employees either. We're all associates. There's kind of like a level playing field mentality. It's like, we want everyone to feel equal. We want everyone to feel that like, no matter what your position is in the company, you have a voice to say something. And we want you to feel that, that we're invested in you. So this pre- professional development, like this consideration for your time, uh, for your energy throughout the day. We want to be considerate of all those things because we want to retain you and we want to invest in your growth because that ultimately makes for a better company and for a better product. I think it's pre- it's a pretty cool thing and I don't see it very often and I'm not sure how folks would go about discovering or finding that kind of thing as they're interviewing. It's just something that I fell into. It's really interesting. I was going to ask you, is this your dream job? Sounds like. <laughs> don't, don't, don't say it. Here we go. Say it. <laughs> I just want to laugh today. Shut you up. <laughs> I, I I will uh, I'll I'll say that it it allows me flexibility to live the sort of life that I want to live. Right. Like okay. I don't know if it's a dream job. Like the the product sometimes can be dry. It can be complex. It can be frustrating because we it's a very old piece of software. Um, so the software development cycle is also based off of waterfall. And we're kind of in this transition of doing like hybrid waterfall, hybrid agile. Mm-hmm. There's a benefit to that though, because our work isn't so crazy intense. Like we're not like releasing something every two weeks or every month. Okay. We release things quarterly, but us as the design team, we like release things internally every month. Mm-hmm. And then the development team takes everything that we've released within that quarter and they develop it and we support it. So it's this weird hybrid thing, which can sometimes be frustrating, but it also provides an opportunity for that professional development time and that extra flexibility. Dream job, I don't know, the verdict's still out on <laughs> Just teasing you, <laughs> love it. So, so, I mean, it sounds like from what we've said, a, a lot of the things surrounding about what makes our jobs difficult and what makes them uh, definitely not in line with what you see on these these vlogs is depending on the position your day is going to be different and your day is always focused on someone else for the most part right it's it's never about this is what i do right this is this is uh, this is how my job is so awesome because i get to do all these things and talk to all these people it's never about that right you want to be in service to your colleagues and that's how you get your job done it's not always glamorous it's it's very rarely glamorous right when i meet someone new and i'm and they're asking me about what i do i mean i'm spending maybe a minute on my job and then i'm getting off to another subject because that is not the thing i want to be talking about (laughs) that that is going to drive people crazy and the meaning culture depending on the role that can really drain you right um that can i think that drains most people more than what they probably anticipate and i didn't see it until i started working at uh wells fargo and I, it, it kind of started getting progressively worse depending on the, the, the additional jobs that I took. That's hard to get used to. And even when you get used to it, you never, you don't like it. Right? It's just one of those things that you never, ever, I guess, unless, like I said, you're one of those people where your job is to stay in meetings that you can't get your job done unless you have people in meetings with you because you get answers to your questions and you do your work in meetings. But that's so much more difficult for everyone else in that meeting. I mean, I've been on kickoff calls that have run six hours, right? Uh, oh. Yeah, or in, and not necessarily calls. Sometimes these these meetings might have been in person, right? Where they, they flew me out to San Francisco or something. And we, we've had two day sessions where they're just all day. You're in a meeting all day. Wow. It's, uh, it's nuts. It's nuts. Intense. I mean, you've got a, You've got a six hour meeting ahead of you, 30 minutes in, your brain is blasted. It's like, how the hell am I going to last for the next five and a half hours in this? It's so unproductive. Yeah. 
yeah that's what it is it's unproductive like at one point there's nothing that yeah. happens and you want but there's always one maybe two people who shine and that mean like they're they're on it right they're let's talk about this and we're going to go through this and they're on it right there again that's their job they're getting their job done in that meeting but for the rest of us who have to take that back you know and go to our desk after that and figure something out what we're going to do following mm -hmm. it's like I don't even remember what the hell we just talked about, right? My brain mm -hmm. is just so quiet. I don't even I don't even know where to begin. Yeah, and I, and I feel kind of in line with that in this whole topic of of these videos. I, I feel like it almost glorifies making your career and your job the definition of who you are in the mm -hmm. center of your life. Mm -hmm. And it can be a big part of your life and something that you're proud of, but I don't think it really should define who you are because like we've talked about in another another show that dream job could lay you off you know that mm -hmm. you could you could have a mind shift in 5 years and not want to do this anymore and like what you've been defining yourself as is no longer a thing so those videos kind of glorify that and i i just i just see things differently i think all three of us do um, mm -hmm. you should have other things in life that you want to live for than just that you know yeah I agree and who the hell has time for oatmeal and fruit every morning? I mean, no. <laughs> uh, definitely not me. <laughs> I don't. Um, well, all right. But I, th I think we've kind of made our statement here. And it's, it's probably a good spot to, to wrap this one up. So I, I, appreciate, I appreciate you guys. That's going to wrap our topic for today. Let's bring in our plus one. And we have our friend, Mr. Scott Smith, who is joining us as our plus one. Scott, good evening. How's it going? Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody in internet land. It's going very well. Glad to join you. All right. Uh, Scott, Scott is in a very interesting position from the time from when uh, I initially spoke to him and, and he was looking for some help and through today, right? Today is, uh, we're recording this on May 23rd. And um, Scott, tell us a little bit about what's transpired for you within the last week and a half or so. <laughs> exactly. So since I, since I had a, an illustrious discovery call with, with Corey, I managed to secure an offer. As of uh, today, I got a written offer in hand with the company that I wanted at the rate that I wanted. I, 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 I'm overjoyed to be reporting this news because I, was, I certainly wasn't reporting this news about a week, week and a half, two weeks ago. But how about we, we start from the beginning? Um, sure. From the point from when you reached out to me. I'm a musician first. I really thought that was gonna be my career, especially during my 20s. I became a professional drummer. Uh, just personally, I'm, I enjoy learning. <laughs> I, I enjoy assimilating information very rapidly. And economics was great for that. So I finished my degree shortly after I got a job with KPMG as an applied researcher. And that kicked off a 10-year career. And so it was a great enterprise level uh, exposure to all of this, this kind of corporate con consulting. So after th 10 years of that, I, I started to uh, burn out on tax. And for me personally, I just got more interested in technology. As I was noticing that, I found out of what UX is. I started going to some networking events and, and uh, boot camps. I went to the Iron Hack uh, boot camp events in Amsterdam. And that, as soon as I found UX people at these events and started talking with them and finding out what they think about on a day to day, I really felt like I had found my people. Uh, it was this mix of creativity and technology and business strategy that it was very appealing to me. And so I decided to take the leap and I enrolled in General Assembly's uh, in immersive UX boot camp at the beginning of 2020, um, had some great team assignments. And sort of the last leg of the story is that my client project was a music technology startup based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And the, the work went very well. And I got along so well with the, the, the founders that they hired me directly out of the boot camp. And I, I became a uh, kind of the, the UX function of a small early stage startup. Um, I'm, I'm looking to, to expand my horizons essentially and wanted to focus much more on UX research and, and that's what I'm just so interested in right now, both because my prior skill set is in research, 
uh, but also I, I find that this is where I would want to be helping UX designers the most. It's interesting that you were, you'd been in kind of a, a, a UX adjacent role for 10 years, you said, right? Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. And, yeah. And then went to a boot camp, had a, a good experience at boot camp, which is great because honestly, yeah, that's, yeah. that's kind of rare from what I write here in, in, my, in my coaching yeah. experience, right? It's, yeah, the, the boot camp won't solve your problems or answer your questions. It's, it's, it's a tool. I yeah. think, it, and I, I, I was so ready for it at that point in time. I think I interviewed General Assembly more than they interviewed me, but I put, I put my entire effort into the boot camp as well. Um, I, I was asking the instructors questions, I, but that's just me. I like to sit in the front of a classroom and ask questions. Awesome. I'm, I'm the one who's going to keep the, the, yeah, the instructor engaged. If not somebody else, I'll start competing with them for attention. <laughs> Tell us about what it took you know, when you were ready to start um, right. working full time. I, I thought that it was going to be a lot smoother of a process because I had, to me, I had some good experience and foundational skills in UX from the boot camp, as well as two years in the startup. And you look at job boards anywhere, it's flooded with UX research and UX design roles. And so I thought just with the sheer demand that, 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 that this would kind of be a, a smoother process. It might, might actually go pretty quickly. I just started applying to companies that I really liked. I did not, I didn't realize in February how much of a long, involved, deep and transformative process this would be. And, and that's, I think that's my biggest lesson that I can impart on any of the listeners, especially the, the younger UX designers and researchers out there is that um, the interview process itself is transformative. I, I didn't actually have to go through an interview process to get my first UX job because I got hired directly out of the boot camp. So what I didn't actually do at that time was collect the user needs from a number of different companies, basically doing my own UX research project on, on the job hunt itself. So once I was finally ready and I was getting on the market, I was noticing that uh, it was not easy to gain the attention of a wide around, amount of companies, mainly because there's a lot of UX designers and researchers out there looking for entry-level positions. One thing um, you said that, that's, that stands out is yeah. uh, we talked about this on another on another show about turning your job search into a project, right? Yeah, and, um, yeah, really yeah. being able to kind of audit yourself, understand that what you need to do to go forward, it has to be very, you have to be very strategic about it. If you go forward into your job search thinking that I learned the skills and so now I'm ready to go and apply, you're going to struggle so badly with that. You can't wing it because yeah. you, you, you think you know the work, right? You can't wing it. Right. We can tell us on the other side, on the hiring side, we can tell when you're winging it. We mm -hmm. can tell when there's points in between the steps of what it takes to get your job done. If you don't understand what that is, we can tell. Right. It's not hard to, to find out if you're if you're not ready. So yeah. just having the skills to do the work is almost never sufficient. Right? You uh, really yeah. have the next part is to learn how to apply, to learn how to interview, to learn to pull what's important. For, um, what's important from those companies out from them and give it back to them in the manner that they're expecting. Absolutely right. And, and yeah. uh, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Antonio. No, I was just going to say, Scott, you said something that stood out to me that I've, I've talked about before in the show, but treating your job hunt in the interview process as a UX project in and of itself, that whole process of interviewing and searching for jobs and talking with folks and going through all the different types of interviews, that's user research. And, and every time you, you don't, you know, move ahead or, or get that offer. It's just another chance to iterate. And I'm, I'm just glad you said that. And it's, it's cool that you were able to do that. And then it worked for you. Absolutely. you know, that it, yeah. it, it worked. Um, well, it, it worked over time. Yes. And, and there was a lot of um, difficulty and doubt and uh, rejection along the way. It's iterative. It's, it it's is a, iterative. Yeah. You're user testing everything. It is. It is. You know? it is. It can be a little bit daunting to realize that because then once you realize that your job hunt is a UX project, it can also dawn on you how much effort it's going to take because this is not something that you can just wing. As soon as I realized I was going to actually have to start iterating and studying the interviewers and their questions as I would a, any kind of project that I was going into, kind of going back to Corey's point too, the, the tasks and the skills, what I noticed was that I was focusing on the job descriptions. And I was focusing on how do I communicate my ability to do this thing that's described in the job description. 
And only through going through interviews, getting rejected, getting feedback from interviews, like really pursuing the interviewees or the interviewers to ask for feedback afterwards to realize that that's, that's a starting point. It's a direction, but they, you, you need to understand what they need that is unspoken mm-hmm. and go, go beneath that stated surface level. This is UX. I mean, this is finding out psychological needs that mm-hmm. people aren't saying and then, and then speaking it to them better than they understand it themselves. Yeah, we, we help identify what users need, even if they yeah. don't know it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. What they want and what, what they need may not always align. Is that, yeah. That's it. Or it's, it, you could say it's, it's like selling a solution before you know the problem. Mm-hmm. And um, which is, an, I mean, so it's funny. I mean, I, one, one person commented, everything is UX. And I love, <laughs> loved that comment because it's hard, it's hard to deny. But um, especially when you are interviewing with senior designers and people who have been doing UX longer than you. I, and I've, I'm, I'm two years I found out about UX three years ago, and I've been two years fully dedicated to it after reading the books and the boot camps and everything. And I'm, I am amazed at how much I pick up from senior designers um, because there's just something that you can't substitute for experience and, yeah. and perspective. A lot of folks are really shocked to find when they get into these interviews and they talk to these senior folks, like we very rarely want to, to talk about your process for making things, right? We, we mm-hmm. want to hear about your process for really getting to the bottom of what's what's wrong, right? What's the problem, right? What are you, what are you really trying to do? The conversation goes so little along the lines of uh, break down how you made this component or how you got into this color, right? We don't, we just don't talk about that. That is such a small part of what we do. If you go into your interviews thinking that because you, because you know how to do that, you got so good at doing that that you can wing the rest of it. It's just not going to work that well for you. No, no. Having having the correct intel to know what problem the person at the other end of the table is trying to solve. If you just start talking about that, you've hit a bullseye. But yeah. you, you kind of need to know that. Yeah. You need to either ask them or figure it out. Tell us a little bit about what happened when you and I met. I got a few a few uh, initial interviews, and um, and then one of my dream companies of all time. Uh, it, it messaged me on LinkedIn and, and said, we, th- we like your background and we think you'd be a great fit here. And I hadn't even applied to them. And I thought this, this is just amazing. So still sort of early on, it was, it was end of February. And uh, I, I had this old resume that was, I, I, I'm just embarrassed to think about it right now, but um, it just didn't look like a UX designer had made it. The alignment was kind of bad. I, I, it had like some old Times New Roman. I mean, it was, anyway, I won't go too far into that, but it got me uh, an interview. And then, and so I, I had a great initial interview with this UX lead, had a great interview with the, um, the, 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 the company HR screener, um, and another, a great interview with the design director. All, all of these had kind of, they were very smooth. I felt like I represented myself very confidently. It just seemed like we had a great rapport building and that they had a direct need for somebody at my level. Um, I got to a panel interview. Well, actually, I had this was my very first panel interview, period. Mm. I didn't know what to expect from a panel interview. Okay. <laughs> I didn't really know that I should have a, a slide deck to show off my case studies. I didn't have that deep of an idea of what their needs were because I was talking with a brand manager, uh, a UX front end engineer, and a marketing manager. And I thought I knew what they needed. It, I, I noticed that this company was facing uh, some challenges in, in bringing in a UX function. But at any rate, uh, after that interview, I felt like it went pretty well. I got positive feedback over email. It basically dragged for a few weeks and then essentially died. I got an email that said, uh, we've had dis- further discussions and decided not proceed at this time. The effect of that was pretty, I was pretty much devastated because I had told other companies that I'm expecting a firm offer. So I kind of started canceling interviews I was really I really just kind of thought that this was it and if and once they said here's the offer I was going to take it yeah so that that was devastating so I so and I, I kind of so the so part b of the story I can kind of <laughs> continue on because uh, that's when I came in touch with you Corey I took the opportunity then to well I basically took about three hours to do absolutely nothing uh, it was, it, I really felt like my ego had been shattered and that I, I needed to figure out something different here because the, my dream industries hadn't really worked out. 
you'll notice all of my case studies involve music. And I thought I really wanted to continue working in the music business. And I think this was a point where I said probably for the sixth time in my life to hell with the music business. Mm. And so I, I turned on a policy of only saying yes. When I blasted every single job board I could, I went out to every mentor I could find, every coach I could find. I started tapping into every LinkedIn uh, feed that I could find where they were talking about UX in any kind of way, realized that there was a lot that I could do personally to develop myself. And so this was a point where, and, and so probably the biggest lesson that I got out of through this entire experience was that these rejections are the most critical lessons to take on in the journey. If, in hindsight, if I hadn't had these rejections, none of this would happen. But during the time, it, it was almost enough to kick me off the, the, the path. I almost thought I was just done. So many people go through that, right? And yeah. some folks take that path, right? Some folks say, you know what? It, this just isn't, I, I can't deal with this, the stress of this, right? The, right. Because it, it, it's, it, it, it compounds, right? It's just over and over and over. And it seems like there's no end to it. Something that I, I've said, I don't know if I've said it on this show yet or not, but I, I'll say it now. I'm not upset to tell the folks is that, you know, sometimes you interview and your interview can go awesome right? You can connect with that other person. You can connect with that team. You can, you walk out of every interview knowing that you absolutely nailed it, right? And you love who you spoke with, right? You have a great outlook for everything. And then they'll still reject you. Right? They'll still reject you. And there's nothing you can do about that. And there's, there's almost nothing worse than having to deal with that. Yeah. One of the tenets that I, I teach and, and, and my students know to go forward with is you never ever stop applying until you've got that you've got that offer in your email in your inbox. Right? And I've even gone so far now as to change it and say, you don't stop applying until you've completed your background check and your know, your pre employment stuff and you've settled on an on, on an official start date. So so getting into um, LinkedIn was a game changer. It still is a game changer. I started following my coaches. Corey just posts. <laughs> and then I found Corey and he said something about how his resume is, not, I'm sorry, your portfolio is not the most glitzy, glamorous thing in the world. And that was the first post that really struck me mm -hmm. because you're speaking from a, a place of experience and um, having an, an advice and genuinely wanting to help um, the, the people looking for the jobs. But also he's kind of struck to the, again, it's like you understood our problem. Like I, I, I can't count how many times I thought that my portfolio needed a facelift to be more glitzy and glamorous because all these other UX designers are outpacing me with their visual design skills. Yeah. And I, I mean, I have an applied research background. I, I like graphic design, I can cut it, but I'm not gonna compete with a fine arts major or, right. or somebody who's spent 20 years in, in Adobe or um, yeah. And, and, and I, I have so much respect for that talent too. It's not how I wanna spend my time though. It, it, was, it, was this, it was this switch from thinking that I could respond to a job requirement but, but you really, it's, it's such a constant iteration and personal development journey that every single interview, I felt like I was a stronger interviewer after that. So my process was to start commenting on LinkedIn and to start picking up uh, discovery calls and, and to uh, just start, start gathering as much help as I possibly could. So I, I revised my resume, that, that kicked in uh, more interviews. I was doing all right. I, got, I, I went through another panel interview, didn't have my slides ready for that one either. I, got great feedback. You know, I'm on the right track, but I also have brevity issues where I over talk and I talk in circles sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I made me realize that I wasn't really clearly answering some of the questions to the point. And, but that also gave me good ammunition to, for, for discovery calls. As a job hunter, it's, it's difficult budgeting wise to hire a coach, even though it, it can, I, I realize if I had done more, uh, more work with coaches early on, it probably would have cut my job hunt process in a third, maybe mm -hmm. a quarter. Uh, but, but just a simple discovery call it can change everything uh, because it can, it can validate or invalidate what you've been already thinking. And just, it, yeah. So, so I had a yeah, discovery call with Corey and, and, and I was starting to see a lot more results, especially using LinkedIn. I was getting more visibility, which was increasing the amount of even, I was starting to get offers randomly, not even trying or applying. I was starting to get emails from random recruiters or people connected with companies wanting to start up conversations, not a single piece alone, changed everything it was it was a momentum it was kind of a snowball good to highlight i think that after scott talked to me uh that was when things really started getting awesome for him right I just want to make sure everyone was clear on that Corey's the reason <laughs> yeah. so I, I was lying actually it's all Corey. <laughs> 
No, actually, um, BC yeah. and AC before Corey right. and after Corey. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when we initially talked, and I, this was a conversation that I've also had with other folks who were kind of in your in your position, and I remember telling you, you know, based on what you've told me, you probably need either a little bit of coaching or you don't need anything. I'm always very cautious of taking on clients or taking on students when they tell me that they've been interviewing a lot, because to me that means you're doing something right. Yeah, that's that's one of the the things about hiring a coach. And, and everyone on the call knows that I don't I don't plug my services here. But if anyone wants to talk to me about it, you know, go ahead. I'm I'm, I'm good to talk. Mm-hmm. But that's something a good coach can can find and can intuit for you. Right? Is exactly where are you on your on your journey? Right? Yeah. Are, you, are you very far off, or are you closer and you just don't realize it? Right? You just need perspective sometimes. Yeah. And you don't have all that. You don't have per- perfect perspective as a job hunter. Right. Tell us what we're down today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, today was the nice, it was just passing the finish line of all the good work that happened last week. Randomly applied at a, a an agency. It, my resume was good enough. I got, I got an interview. The interview just, I, I felt like I was so ready for this interview with this person by this point in time that I knew what to, to listen for. And I really appreciated how they, how they phrased um, UX. To me, they sold it I was ready to buy buy it <laughs> from her, and I and um, so they issued a uh, technical evaluation. I was going through not not actually not a single other company that I've interviewed with has issued a take home evaluation, but they did, and I was kind of thinking, gosh, this is a, a lot of homework. But I looked at the challenge, and I thought that this would just be a great exercise for me to do. Period. This would be something that would make me a better person by actually investing the time into it. So I, I did it. I, I wrote out what I would consider, it was almost like a statement of work that I might construct in a big four to, to, to scope out a, a project where I'd say, this was like a company approached you and they have this problem, kind of structure, how would you structure out like a one-year research plan? It's like, you can't I know the answer to that. In fact, every answer anybody gives to this is going to be different. But I, I said, okay, well, let's make us a phased approach and let's go through all of these details with lots of, of outs for iteration along that path. And, um, and it turned into about a, an eight page statement of work. And I just, I just hit period and said, if they like it, they like it. If they don't, maybe I'll get some feedback on it. Um, I mean, this is a 48 hour test assignment. So I just see how, what works. And about a week later, they got back and said, we're really interested. We thought that your technical, technical evaluation was really fascinating and, and yeah, we want to continue the discussions. So I thought this is great. Good. I also had a lot of other interviews going on, but nobody was really honing in to the level of details this company. And so, yeah, so last Thursday, through one of these other interviews, about three years, so I, I applied to one company. Three days later, I got an interview and I actually got an offer on the spot. That was about that was the week preceding this. And that was, that was my very first offer in hand. They were not my first choice, but it was great to have that offer in hand. And then they actually be able to communicate to this company. It was my choice, my, kind of my first choice to say, I, I, my time is limited because I've got this offer in hand that I need to give them an answer for. And I like it. I don't want to give up an offer, um, mm-hmm. but I want to proceed. And so they, they really worked hard to abbreviate the time. Um, to get the, the all of the interviews and within the time frame that I was I was asking for, and that turned into about four hours of interviews last Thursday between a technical panel, hiring manager interview, and then an hour and a half with the founder itself. That so after <laughs> by the end of all that, I felt like I, I was so invested in this company already, and actually just loved everything I'd heard with them. I didn't feel out of place. I felt like actually authentic. So so yeah. So Friday they they gave the verbal offer, and today they sent the written offer. Me, you know, a lot of folks listening, you know, know my stance on take-home challenges or whatever. Like me right. as a coach, I would have told you not to do that, right? Right. But, you know, your uh, your position was, I like this challenge. Right? Yeah. I, I think I can benefit from this challenge, so I'm going to do it. And, and I would have encouraged you there. Just, okay, if that's how you feel, go ahead and do it. Yeah. But I've also cautioned you. It's like, be ready that this might end up being a waste of time, right? But <laughs> that's that's. That's my take. Right? That's, that's from my when I when I when I emailed that challenge out, I thought that um, it was going into the nether, and I was yeah. never going to hear from them again. Yeah, the I feel like the way that that challenge worked out was great, and that you don't always hear that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have been really disappointing from from me. I mean, from everyone to hear that you spent 
that you invested so much time in something that you really were interested in, right? And then for it to have fallen flat, right? Have... Well, well, let me give you this angle. This is the per personal development angle because I knew that this was going to be good for me to go through as a process and a skill building maneuver. I, I've never actually really done something to the level of detail that I did here because I, I kind of I kind of had some some purpose to do. I wanted to see what they would say and if if I could get feedback even better. But mm -hmm. what practically happened was I I completed that challenge on Monday sent it in on Tuesday. Friday, I had this interview with the other company that gave me the offer. And she asked me basically an abbreviated form of that question. Mm. Do you know how I answered it? Exactly how I'd written it out in that. Yeah. So I, I was so prepared for her to answer that question that by the time she was asking it, I already knew how I was going to answer it because I'd written it out. Interesting. And so I credit that kind of personal development with really just putting this this offer over the top, which then kind of cycled back around to build momentum on the other company. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, it's 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 again, it's great to hear that things have, have kind of solidified for you in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then when when we first talked, you were you know I could hear the frustration. You know, uh, you've you've got a great like, personality. You know, you've got a you know you keep a great smile. And but you know I see you know, when folks are kind of at that boiling point, right? Because I've been there, right? And I see right. a lot of folks go in there. This is, you just want to bang the wall because you are ready to work. Yeah. You're hungry. You've invested in the boot camp. You've put some time into this portfolio, which is, who is this for but these hiring managers? Right. And I was like, what? I'm ready to do good UX work. And this is taking months. I mean, right. this this and so the job market itself just felt very inefficient to me, but I was in the middle of it. And I hadn't gotten that to that finish line. That's... Nobody, nobody, uh, nobody manages this for you. Mm -hmm. That's a really tough problem. It, I mean, but so paying a coach to help manage it for you is it's really <laughs> valuable. <laughs> it's really valuable. <laughs> Question uh, that I have for you guys, which is now, I, mean, I, I got this portfolio to a point where it was getting the interviews and at least I could, you know, work with it with, to, 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 to build up case study slides for the, the panels. Um, but going forward, I'm going to have more case studies. I'm going to be iterating on and evolve, this portfolio uh, will evolve over time. I was just, I was curious how, how, uh, what advice would you guys give to, um, as, as I'm starting to, to, to work on new projects and think about new case studies to bring into it, what is a way to make this more, more of a living document? <laughs> I feel like I had to drop out of life for about a full month just to build this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really know what to say because I actually haven't touched my case study in two years. Love it. Almost yeah. every designer I know, once they get the job, like they ignore their case study. I, yes. I have a good friend. <laughs> heard, it, heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, my design manager, I don't think he's touched it in like five or six years. I have a good friend who's a senior designer in London. He's like, I, I haven't touched my, my case study in the entire time I've, or my portfolio in the entire time I've had this job. So my, my advice would be if you if you find it interesting, if it's fun for you, if it's sort of a, uh, a fun exercise for you to kind of document this stuff, then document it, kind of have them in your back pocket ready to go. You don't always have to stress about making sure your website's always up to date. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say don't stress about it. Um, yeah. I work on mine when I have the time, but I'm not stressing about it because I don't need it right now. It's not a tool. Yeah, so, so it's more of a... Like it's a tool that you need when you need it. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm more focused on learning, uh, learning and spending time at the job that I use the case study to get. Right. Rather than, or, or the portfolio, rather than focusing on the portfolio now, right? Exactly. It's not my main priority. Like now you're going to be in this position where I think you're going to learn a lot and it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose. And yeah. you're going to be like, I don't even want to touch that case study because I'm fried at the end of the day right yeah. right yeah. that's how i expect to be and that's how i want to be <laughs> yeah. this interesting paradigm that a lot of us get into is that a lot of the work that you end up doing isn't going to need to be in your portfolio anyway right a lot of it is just not going to find its way there because it's either too small or it's too derivative or it's too uninteresting right that's that's a that's to, that's just kind of the truth of where we you know we, we work at jobs we do uh you know our jobs aren't all everything that we do isn't always this really grand project and this really awesome thing that we, you know, we put together or that we found out or that we, you know, solved. Everything isn't like that. And so yeah. um, everything isn't going to find its way in your portfolio. And that's okay. <laughs> like Antonio said, I, I, I don't touch my portfolio until it's time for me to find another job. Right? Right. That's, that's right. usually the, that's usually when I go in and mess with it. That's a great point, Corey, because I've, I've done so much 
little things since I've been in UX where I'm just like, this is not even worth being put right. in the portfolio or it's not allowed to be there. Yeah. Right. You know, right. unless you give someone a password to view an NDA block page, it's just like, I can't, I can't show it because I'm under an NDA. So it's just like, you have to almost do freelance work or fun work or concept work to put stuff in your portfolio. And just like, why am I even doing that at this point? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm curious what then becomes more of a priority building community, personal branding. Yeah. I'll say Scott, that I was so blown away by how different the reality of the industry is versus the industry on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and the industry on YouTube and the industry on Instagram, because it's not so it's, like that at all. No one is so good to hear. No yeah. one gives a shit about your personal brand when yeah. you're in the company. No one cares yeah. about any of that crap that I spent so much time right. trying to cultivate. I got there. No one, no one cared. Yeah. It's about the work. It's about being there with your team. It's about learning the discipline and learning that we're here to meet the needs of the business and meet the needs of our users. And that's what we're focusing on right now. And if you yeah. want to work on your brand or your logo, then you're in the wrong place. Right. That was a huge shock to yeah. me. Um, yeah. I think that for job seekers, especially like me doing user interviews with people like you who, who can say something like that is so critical because we're obviously we, 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 we get our education a lot, largely from LinkedIn and YouTube and the boot camps and online because there's a lot of resources out there available and YouTube is full of UX design mentors and coaches I mean you yeah. just feel like you can get an education there alone but what you're not getting is what, what you just mentioned Antonio just the day in and day out what actually matters yeah and, and um yeah because yeah, that's what's going to that's going to affect the, the decision that the hiring the people hiring you are going to make right mm -hmm. and you you referenced that, that post i made where I, I i showed what my portfolio looks like and, and so many people were like what and, and that, that's always the the uh the reaction i get it's like no way I, that can't be I'm like yeah that's what it is and so it's like you're going to see that i'm like you're the veil is going to be uncovered you're going to see what it's really like you know behind not behind the scenes but just what it, what really goes on under the hood like once you get in and once you see you know yeah. like damn this ain't shit right this is, you know yeah. what was that what was i so afraid of? like what was i so concerned about it's it's, it's nowhere near the the kind of chaotic minefield that you think it is you know trying to get in right once you once you cross that that um what's that border between the koreas uh the, 40s you know, ninth parallel something yeah like whatever it is yeah, <laughs> the it's, zone it's, of Control. I don't know. <laughs> Internet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go crazy. And I'm gonna putting it somewhere. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, once you once you cross over, you'll be like, "This is I can handle this." Right? This is nowhere near as stressful as as crazy as I thought it was going to be because of what it took to get here. Right? Right. Yeah. You'll you'll see the difference. It's night. It's night and day. It's night and day. And you'll see. <laughs> Corey, if, if I could ask you really quick, could you tell that story about when the person said this is one of my be the best portfolios I've ever seen, period? Yeah, I mean, I still get that. I still, still get, get that. Okay, today. that's not yeah. one person. That's... No, that's not one person. That's, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's, that's several people that have said that. Right. Um, that caught my eye. Yeah. And it's, and like I said, that was not something that I spent a, a huge amount of time on. And the, you know, when I tell people about using Webflow and all that stuff, it's like, I don't do that. Right. I, find, I use WordPress and people poop on WordPress for whatever reason. I don't know why. Uh, I love WordPress because I go in and I make a few edits and I, and I sign on and I'm done in like five minutes. And I get that kind of a response from recruiters and hiring managers when they, when they see it. And that layout, that, uh, that theme that I use for, for my, my website, I bought that theme for like 65 bucks on uh -huh. uh, like theme for us, or I think it was some other, some other template site. And uh, I bought it under the category. I think it was, uh, ooh, what was it? I think it was photography or something. I went through, a, I just found something that I liked. I'm like, this, this looks simple enough. This looks like something that I could manage and update without, without it being, you know, too much of a headache. And I paid for it. And that, that was it. And I've used the same one ever since. That's great. I mean, there's no question when you look at your portfolio. Question answered, question answered, question answered. You know exactly where I should go. Yeah. Keep it right. simple. Yeah. Right. You don't have to think. That's the, the Steve Krug's thing. You get, just don't, don't make the user don't, think. Don't make me think. Yeah. 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 And I mean, you, it, I was going to say, when you, when you consider the feedback that a lot of hiring managers have when they look at portfolios, it's like, I can't tell what this person did. Right? I can't. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's like your portfolio is there specifically to tell so folks can understand what you did. 
right. but we use it in such a poor way and that it, it's just it's why bother having it if you're if you're going to blow it up in the way the way we, we, we typically do it i have the assumption that the further along you get in your career the sort of less it matters oh yeah um, yeah because my my design mentor and and manager he's been in design for 30 years and he has a behance site with screenshots and captions <laughs> that's it <laughs> Yeah. So when I told him like what I did to my portfolio, he was like, that's crazy. I can't believe like that's how the industry is these days. You know, it's just because it's like you get to a certain point where it's just like you just get jobs based off of networking or the fact that it's just like I just have these skills and I'm so right. ingrained in it. Mm -hmm. This doesn't matter anymore. I don't have to. I'm past that point. And, they, and they'll they'll get that. And, you know, you've already proven yourself. Well, Scott, one of the questions you have for us. I'm curious, um, as I'm kind of moving more into my career I'm more, I'm more and more interested in mentoring as I get the experience I realize I do have some experiences that are valuable I don't have to wait until I'm an expert and 60 years old to start telling you know helping people so I'm curious if you have any advice for for UXers who are kind of moving it moving forward in their career and how and what yeah what what are what are good topics to mentor on what do you think would be most beneficial to, to be helping with the, the, the juniors moving up that's a good question. I would say don't brush into that because um, yeah. I, I know a lot of us want to pay it forward, right? Yeah. Uh, especially when you've gone through so much to get there and you really- I have a lot of people to thank yeah. and it makes me realize how important it was. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't he be here without the help that I've received. Yeah. And, and I, I, think, I think that's probably the best approach for right now is Got it. to kind of acknowledge what it took for you to get there. You know, connect folks to the same folks that you were connected to and uh have them kind of do the heavy lifting and you'll you'll know when you're when you're ready to start giving advice i would say don't don't rush into that because that's honestly that's a that's a big reason why we have these kind of youtube personalities and these kind of quote unquote celebrities around mm -hmm. ux and, and a lot of it is really unwarranted right there's a lot of folks who get a job at google straight out of college and then suddenly they're a ux expert right for that reason which is crazy so uh, I would say don't don't fall into that. Just uh, allow your skills and your career to kind of mature, and you'll you'll know. Right? It's, it. it's easy to know when when folks are when they're genuine about what they know and what they can help people with, and the other folks who who just want the cloud. Right? Got it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. What do you guys think separates somebody who's been in the field for a decade or two from? somebody who's in the first year, you know, out of boot camp or in the first year or two in the market? Mm, that's a good question. You might, you might get like me where you just don't give a shit about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean that in the best way possible, right. if, if you right. can mean that in a, in a, in a, in the best way. Um, you get to that point where things stop phasing you, right? When you've mm -hmm. seen so much and you've addressed so much and you've done so much where things just don't bother you anymore right things just kind of roll off your shoulder and it's like you know what i've seen this i i, I know how to deal with this uh, people are kind of freaking out around you you know the, the place is burning down you're like whatever i know exactly how to get through this i've seen how to get there or maybe you haven't done it or haven't seen it but you know that there's a there's a positive at the end of it and so you're just not going to let it affect you right someone has to keep a level head i'm usually the one that's that's keeping a level head that will tell people to calm the hell down, right? To just let's let's break this apart. Like we break down every single problem that we have, break it into something that we can manage and then let's address it from there. Yeah, it's um, very systematic even, or you've learned yeah. some systematic ways. Right, right. And approach. You, yeah, and you you get used to that. Um, you get used to people getting offended by stuff like that because when people get excited or, or stressed out and you're not stressed out, people get offended by stuff like that. So Yeah, and I would just add to that. When you start noticing these things in yourself, it's a sign of maturity as a designer and, and you'll see them in, in mature senior level designers is they know that imposter syndrome exists mm -hmm. and they'll always have it. It'll never mm -hmm. go away. Mm -hmm. And number two is they never take the work personally. They never... Mm -hmm. They never get upset when someone totally shoots holes in their design. They never get upset when deliverables aren't what they expected because at the end of the day, they remember, this isn't about me. This mm -hmm. isn't my personal endeavor. This mm -hmm. is about the user. And yeah. if my design is not liked for X, Y, and Z, well, that means I need to go back to the drawing board and figure out where did I miss the user needs? Where did I not identify the problem? 
Yeah, super, super important that you said that. And I want to give you another little, a little secret, something that I do want to say. Again, I hope my bosses are listening. But uh, you know, sometimes when I'm when I'm on the hook to to put something together, and I I don't have it right, or maybe I don't really understand it completely, you know. But I'm on the hook to put something together. I will honestly sometimes I will put anything together. Like I was like, I don't know how this is going to work. I have an idea. Here's what I'm going to do, and then I'll take it into like kind of a team, like a peer review. And then I'll let them take a look at it. And if it's something wrong, everyone's going to tell you what's wrong with it. Right? Everyone is going to tear it apart. And then, bam, you've just crowdsourced your answer, right? And you don't have to do anything. Right? So, I did know, that yeah. last week. And there you go. So, <laughs> this is the little tricks that you learn. The more you're, the more you're in the, the more you're in the industry, the more you work. It's like you can crowdsource your work, you know, because right. people love to tell you how wrong your shit is. Right? Yeah. 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 And Thanks like, for okay. all the answers. I'll see you next week with yeah, new, new mock-ups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and just to add a comment that I feel like is kind of adjacent to this is I feel like there's a lot of sort of glitz and glamour around UX design right now, especially mm -hmm. on the internet, but in kind of all the wrong ways. So new designers, fresh designers coming out to the world, never have having a design job before, or even a job before yeah. they want to work for the Apple. They want to work for the Google or the Netflix and kind of get that fancy role that they see on a day in the life blog in on YouTube. But yeah. I think the true value lies in landing with an organization that is newly is just adop adopting UX, uh, mm -hmm. um, maybe isn't so familiar with it, is trying to build a team, is trying to scale a department. Like that's where you're going to learn. That's where you're going to kind of be involved with a, a product that needs help. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where you're going to be put to the test. That's where research is really going to come into play yeah. and, you know, design skills are really going to come into into play, and it's not glamorous, but it's like true hardcore UX work. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think that gets talked about enough, sort of in the mainstream design culture that we're in nowadays. Yep. It's all about design systems and dribble screenshots, and I don't care about that stuff. Well, uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up this segment then, Scott. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thanks for walking us through your journey. Congratulations again on getting that offer. Uh, I know for a fact that you've been struggling for a while and uh, it's great when folks come out on top, right? And it was, so it, at the end of the day, it's all worth it, right? Thank you guys so much for your, for, yeah, your continued help and, uh, and yeah, given your, giving your time and your skills to the community. Right. Well, yeah. Many congratulations, Scott. Thank I'm you. Really Thank you so for much. Your, uh, for your journey. I think uh, you're going to love it. Yeah. Appreciate it so much. All right, Scott. Well, you take care. We'll be in touch again, all right? Cheers. All right. See ya. Bye, Scott. All right, my friends. That is going to wrap us up for today. If you are interested in appearing on our show as a plus one guest, there is a form that you can fill out for the opportunity. That is at uxdesignjob.com forward slash podcast. Again, that is uxdesignjob.com forward slash podcast. Hope you've enjoyed this one. We appreciate your support and please remember that no matter what you do to always remember to include your plus one. See you next time.